Do it. All right. Okay, wow. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Hyde Park Town Hall. Wonderful to see so many people here and so many people engaged in this process of trying to create a new town center for Hyde Park. So um, we're going to go ahead and open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. So please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> There's uh, two empty chairs on this side, if you'd like, and yep. there's some right in the middle as well. And Ooh. some in the front also. So yeah. Okay, so some more people coming in. Wow, again, so great to see so many people here. Um, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of the evening and uh, introduce the um, consultants that we have here that we've had the privilege of working on these various projects for the last couple of years. And um, I just want to say at the outset that they're top notch and it's really been uh, very educational and informative for me. I was just talking with my husband the other day and I said, you know, it's something Everyone feels uh, very, um, very much a part of their town, so they feel very comfortable on, on uh, making uh, suggestions and comments, and that's very, they're all very welcomed. Uh, but there is a whole body of knowledge and education that uh, people that have been involved in the industry have. And so I'm grateful for having had uh, their, uh, their input and their support and uh, you will, I think you will see when you see the presentation the great detail and the great amount of effort that was involved. And uh, in addition to the con consultants, we have a lot of uh, volunteer uh, citizens who participated as well as people from Dutchess County. And so I really just want to thank them all for their participation, their efforts, their knowledge, and, and for being here tonight. So I'll just give a brief rundown of what we're going to do and accomplish, and then I'm going to pass this over uh, to Emily Svensson, who will uh, do her part, and we'll get to that. So uh, again, you know, this is the Hyde Park Downtown Initiative Update, and I'll just give you a, a brief history, and, and we go over it pretty regularly, so I won't go into too great detail, but in 2014, with the help of a NYSERDA Cleaner Greener Communities Grant, uh, the town formed a steering committee to devise a plan to revitalize our aging, deteriorated town center. Basically, we knew from the outset what we wanted, a vibrant, walkable area char characterized by service and retail establishments, restaurants, cafes, and a variety of housing choices. Um, this resulted in a, uh, a great and engaging public process where we had more than 100 people attend two meetings to share their hopes and their thoughts on our town. Um, in addition to, to the public engagement part, we had a market analysis and a sewer study uh, that uh, were performed as part of this grant. So the studies and the public engagement and all these other uh, sources of information were compiled uh, into a document that we um, is now available on our town website as well as hpdowntown.com. Uh, but they, they all pointed in the same direction, and, and we all agreed, actually, on what we wanted, which is pretty good. I, I, I feel good about that. It doesn't often happen that consensus is easily achieved. But we it was decided, it was mentioned, it was uh, agreed that we want a vibrant, walkable area characterized mm -hmm. by service and retail establishments, restaurants, cafes, variety of housing, and in other words, a downtown. Um, so knowing where we wanted to go was actually the very easy part, but knowing how to get there, a bit more complicated. And so that answer really became the Hyde Park Downtown Initiative, uh, which is a series of actions that the town can take to re revitalize our business district. So it's a, a three-pronged approach uh, to economic development and to creating community character. It's a way to leverage our historic and natural assets to grow our tax base, provide housing to, to meet today's needs, improve our curb appeal, and our property values. 
So we established three parallel tracks mm -hmm. to pursue under the downtown initiative. And um, tonight we have presentations on all three segments, uh, the pedestrian improvements, the updated zoning code, and the Route 9 commercial sewer district. So uh, for the pedestrian segment, Emily Svensson, our new uh, downtown initiative coordinator, former town board member, uh, will review the big picture on the overall plan for creating a more walkable town and the connection of the various projects that we have already constructed. Um, and we also have, as part of that segment, uh, Ed Schneider and Addison Hawkins from GPI. They are the consultants that we have retained to do the design of our uh, second phase of our pedestrian pedestrian improvements on Route 9, and so they'll be giving a very specific presentation um, on uh, this next phase of our um, pedestrian improvements. And at the conclusion of that, there will be um, a few minutes to answer general questions. Our um, town engineer, Pete Zotero, will hand out some comment forms to provide to people. Uh, and then Addison uh, from GPI will collect those as you leave. Or you can email them to me on the address that's provided on the form. And um, it's important that we do get that feedback as soon as possible if you have some to give because this project is being funded through a DOT uh, TAP grant, um, which is federal money, and it has a very rigid and strict process that we all have to follow in order to assure that we get those funds. And part of that is that they want to make sure that the public has an opportunity to weigh in. So we definitely appreciate it if you jot down a few <coughs> thoughts um, and leave those uh, either with Addison or email them to me. So uh, then um, we have, after our pedestrian um, improvement uh, presentation, we'll have a presentation by Bonnie Franson of Nelson, Pope, and Voorhis uh, who, on our town core zoning. And um, Bonnie worked with our committee of, of uh, volunteers. It was you know, the town board, planning board, a representative from Dutchess County Planning, uh, and we all worked together to craft this code that we believe will uh, enable this vibrant village feeling uh, improvement to exist. So uh, it's been really wonderful to work with Bonnie. I, I, I appreciate it. And i got to say, we're doing it um, just like we do everything in Hyde Park uh, with public funding that is, doesn't burden the local taxpayer and on a shoestring. So uh, <laughs> Bonnie has really been uh, very helpful. And, and we've really made the meetings very focused. So appreciate that. And then uh, the third aspect of the downtown initiative is the commercial sewer district that we're creating. And uh, our downtown coordinator and I will, will uh, do a short presentation and, and um, review where the status of that improvement. So, uh, you know, just to cut to the chase, and I, I think people um, are, have been listening to us for quite some time talk about this, but, you know, we believe the goals and benefits of the downtown initiative are, are quite clear. Uh, you know, more sh shopping and dining options, more attractive streets, streetscapes, uh, something a lot of people don't think about because we do get feedback from people in other in the other parts of our community who uh, wonder how that will benefit them to have a strong town center and um, in addition to the items I just mentioned that it will be very beneficial to the tax base uh, in terms of we will now have the higher and better uses for our existing properties which will uh, shift some of the burden that the residents feel onto the commercial properties who are generating revenue from these improvements. So, you know, that's kind of the overall uh, perspective that one should take when we are looking at the sewer project in particular. And I, I, I won't uh, go over all the details, but just to be very clear, it is a project that is only paid for by those people that will be in the district because they're the only people that benefit. So we'll go into greater detail on that. So. Um, uh, then uh, at, we will have a brief intermission because we actually have to have a, a public hearing on a on a stop sign law. So we we're mixing that into this meeting, and it wasn't really planned that way, but you know, it just kind of happened. So, uh, but that will give us about ten minutes for for a little break. Um, and again, uh, we'll be ask, asking the public to ask general questions at the conclusion of each presentation uh, for very specific 
questions about your particular property, we encourage you to contact us. Or GPI, uh, if it's about the pedestrian improvements, they will be here and they can be out in the foyer to answer your specific questions. So um, uh, finally, after the sewer and the um, zoning uh, components of the meeting, uh, Pete Sotero, again, will pass out some comment forms and we'd love for your comments on that as well. So um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to our downtown initiative coordinator, Emily Spenson, and she'll kind of walk everyone through the big picture here. And before you start, Em, if you guys yeah. want to fill in, there's a couple empty chairs here in the yeah, middle. Yeah, come on in. If you'd like to come on in. Okay, what can I, is this one? It's on it. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Well, it's great to be here, and, and thank you all for coming out. Um, it's it's really uh, wonderful to see so many here from the community. It seems like every time we have one of these, we think, oh, a few people will come, and then the room is full. So it's it's really nice to see how much interest there is and, uh, and get your feedback as well. So I just wanted to give a quick overview. This was a slideshow I prepared for another purpose, and Aileen said, you got to show this because it kind of gives the overview of what we're doing with the sidewalks. And then um, GPI will give the, the details on the next phase. Um, oops. Oh, I messed it up already. Let's see. Okay, so just a little overview on the downtown initiative in general. If you look at, you know, kind of, this is the, the aerial view looking down at Route 9, the north is that direction. And you can really see that we have this core in Hyde Park that is just ready to become the downtown of, of, of our community. And um, kind of bookended by the, the mansions, and then there's the, the a neighborhood, you know, all through the middle there. And, and plenty of room where it could really be redeveloped as a strong downtown that provides jobs and services and shopping and um, economic development. So as Aileen said, the downtown initiative has three components, uh, zoning updates, <coughs> sidewalks, and sewer, um, kind of breaking it down and, and focusing in. Uh, the zoning, we, we did a zoning update already for the crossroads area. Bonnie's going to talk about the zoning update for the central area. Um, and so the sidewalks, the first segment that we did uh, runs from approximately the Quality Inn up to Park Plaza. And the next segment that we're going to be doing goes from Park Plaza up to just past Pinewoods Road. And then we also did a little segment on Pinewoods Road. So I'll just go over those quickly. So first, why sidewalks? You know, why did we decide to work on sidewalks in our community? First is just obvious, make walking more safer and more appealing. So, you know, nobody wants to walk where there isn't a safe place to walk. Now there is, so that's kind of the, the basic. Um, but then there's really other levels to it. Uh, improving our streetscape makes uh, Hyde Park a more attractive place for businesses to invest and for visitors to stop and, and visit. So, you know, this is kind of an image of, of what, we, what our potential is. And quite honestly, there's also just been a lot of funding available for sidewalks because it's been a priority of the state and county governments. So where we started was big picture planning, the Hyde Park Walk Study, um, which was a volunteer-led effort to catalog and document where our sidewalks exist, where we don't have them, and where they're in bad condition. And based off of that, we decided on the first TAP project. So that was done with a, a TAP grant, which is Transportation Alternatives Program. Um, it covered the area from Quality Inn to Park Plaza and included sidewalks, crosswalks, a bike-friendly shoulder, and lighting, which isn't there yet, but is coming soon. <laughs> so as you'll remember, that's, that's the sidewalk going in and the, the stone wall going up. And now, that's what you see today. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe and I. <laughs> um, and so then the other project that's already gone in is the CDB Community Development Block Grant funded sidewalk on Pinewoods Road. 
And the idea there was to connect Route 9 up to the Pinewoods Park with a, a safe walkway. And we immediately got a ton of positive feedback on that. People saying, you know, I, I couldn't take my, my toddler to the park without getting in my car, and now I can. And so that's, that's what you want to see. So that sidewalk has gone in. Um, you will notice that the, it doesn't really seem to have a good ending at the intersection with Route 9. That will be developed um, probably next year when the DOT does their intersection improvement at Pinewoods Road. And then the other way we're getting sidewalks along our corridor is um, that the planning board is, um, is working with private developers to add sidewalks to their projects. So those are all the ways that we're getting sidewalks in the Route 9 corridor. And the next big phase that's coming up, um, I'm going to turn this over to GPI to talk about. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. <coughs> need the computer to cooperate. Excellent. <clears throat> so as Emily mentioned, my name is Ed Snyder. Uh, I'm with GPI and tonight I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the sidewalk project, the next phase. So I'd like to thank Aileen, Emily, and Pete, um, and all you folks actually for coming out and, and being <coughs> part of this process. It's really uh, nice to see everybody energetic and happy to see, uh, you know, what uh, that they're happy um, with what's happening in their town so uh, so thank you again so as part of tonight's agenda I'm going to discuss the project overview discuss where the location what the limits are you know s describe some of the existing conditions you know what the deficiencies are uh, within the corridor and what we're trying to accomplish out there that leads us to our design alternatives we're going to discuss a little bit about the right-of-way process and why we need right-of-way to accomplish uh, this ultimate goal of getting new sidewalks in, the overall project cost, and then project schedule. And then as Emily had mentioned, we're going to discuss a little bit about the lighting project also that's uh, happening within, within the town. So for uh, questions or comments, there is the uh, uh, Caroline Miller's uh, email address right up here. And then Pete does have handouts, uh, comment forms that if you are interested in providing comments on uh, what you're seeing tonight, please get one from Pete. And Addison is the lovely long, young lady right in the back with the red shirt on. Um, so if you've got a comment form completed tonight, feel free to give those to Addison. So I'll discuss a little bit about what our project limits are. So we're, end, we're starting right where the previous project ended. So right here is Park Plaza. And the previous sidewalk project ended just south of Park Plaza. So we're tying in at that location and continuing further north. It's approximately 1,800 feet of sidewalk that we're looking to install. At Park Plaza itself, we've got new pedestrian signals that were proposed there. We want to get uh, pedestrians safely across that intersection. We've got some new improved crossing locations. So at Crumwald Place, there's an existing crossing there. However, it's not ADA compliant. So somebody with a disability, either visually impaired or uh, maybe in a wheelchair, would really have a tough time navigating through that portion, uh, crossing the roadway there. So we're looking to improve that. And as we continue further north, we've got the Pine Woods intersection. As Emily had mentioned, New York State DOT is looking at installing uh, a, new, a full traffic signal replacement at that uh, signal and uh, putting new pedestrian accommodations in there as well. And lastly, we continue further north and then just north of the uh, firehouse driveway. So those are our overall project limits. So what are our project objectives? We want to get new sidewalks in from Park Plaza up to the firehouse. We want those sidewalks to be ADA compliant along with all the, the handicap ramps. We want to get appropriate signage in there so uh, vehicles know where to expect pedestrians crossing and pedestrians are aware of what's happening around them as well as getting new high visibility striping out within the corridor, looking at getting new crosswalks in. So again, as a vehicle is approaching a crosswalk, it's a visual cue to understand that a pedestrian may be crossing the roadway. We want to incorporate new landscaping features. 
That's something that's really absent of the corridor. You'll notice as we go through the presentation, the sidewalk is right up tight against the curb line. We're looking at improving that vertical or that horizontal separation, getting some uh, new aesthetic qualities and landscaping within the corridor. Sorry, I'm blocking your view a little bit. And lastly, talk a little bit about um, where we're proposing traffic and pedestrian signal improvements. So uh, to familiarize yourself with what the corridor looks like, the picture on the left shows uh, Park Plaza. And as we look north, you can see we've got this large expanse of crossing, uh, no crosswalks, uh, non-compliant ADA ramps. Again, really tough for somebody that's e either visually impaired or in a wheelchair to navigate through, through that crossing. So that's definitely a deficiency we want to address. I'd mentioned the crossing at Crumwald Place. As you can see, uh, it might be a little tough, but we've got a handicap ramp on the far side of the road, but as you come across, you got a full six inch curb with no handicap ramp. So if you're in a wheelchair, that'd be very tough to navigate uh, across there. So again, another deficiency that we wanna, wanna address as part of this project. As we travel further north and looking at the Pine Woods intersection, we can see, you know, we've got uh, crosswalks shown. However, if you're out and actually look at this handicap ramp, it's extremely steep. Um, and there are no detectable warnings. Again, so somebody visually impaired coming through with their uh, cane or indicator, trying to get that uh, cue to know that they're crossing a road, it's really non-existent. So again, another deficiency we wanna address as part of this project. And as we turn around in the picture on the right and look, uh, we're probably around where the, uh, the yogurt store is, looking down towards uh, El Guacamole. Um, you can see, again, We've got some deficient pavement in there, not a great surface for uh, a pedestrian trying to navigate through the corridor. So another, another thing we wanna try and address and, and formalize as part of this project. So you'd think, pretty straightforward. All right, we're just gonna go out and build new sidewalks. However, as you had heard, um, there's, there's federal funding in place. So with that federal funding, there's a whole series of standards that we need to adhere to. What further complicates things is we're along uh, US Route 9, which is a New York State DOT highway. So New York State DOT has a lot of requirements that we must follow and adhere to. So these standards with New York State DOT Highway Design Manual, uh, some of the AASHTO manuals, the MUTCD, which gives us our signing and striping requirements, all these need to be adhered to. And those actually set the design criteria for what we can actually build. So for our minimum sidewalk width, that we're allowed to build is four feet with a five foot desirable width. We've got a five foot maximum grade. So as you're going down the sidewalk, the grade can exceed more than 5%. We've got vertical clearance requirements. So anything over the top of the sidewalk, whether it be a signage, um, you know, if there's anything overhanging, uh, lighting, et cetera, needs to be a minimum of six feet, eight inches. And then lastly, our, our sidewalk cross slope. So we've got a one and a half percent desirable or um, desirable cross slope, but we're allowed to go to 2%. Again, so as somebody's, uh, if they're in a wheelchair wheeling down, um, you know, it's, it's not uh, an un unsafe surface for them and they can navigate through the corridor safely. So as you can see, all those standards that we're required to, to adhere to lead us into our design criteria, which is gonna follow and dictate what we're actually gonna build for sidewalks within the corridor. So using our design standards, we then can move into developing our preliminary alternatives. And we're in the very early stages at this, at this point. And you'll see alternative one to no build, you might be thinking to yourself, why would you propose an alternative that does nothing? So again, with federal funding in place, that is an actual requirement that you look at not doing anything. Um, <laughs> again, <laughs> it's, it, sounds, it sounds very very strange, but this is a requirement for all, all projects using federal funding and, and in different situations, maybe on a bridge project or uh, you know, a different highway replacement project, looking at that, it may not be feasible, um, or that, that alternative of doing nothing may be feasible and not require spending the federal money. In our case, doing nothing doesn't, doesn't ac accomplish our goals of getting those new sidewalks uh, for, uh, for ADA compliance throughout the corridor. So our build alternative constructs those new sidewalks on the east side of Route 9, we construct ADA compliant roadway crossings, handicap ramps. We get uh, new pedestrian refuge islands in where feasible. And then we create a, a landscape buffer. So that's our, our build alternative. 
and that meets our project goals and objectives. So what does that alternative look like? So right now, we've got a travel lane in each direction in a center turn lane or a left-hand turn lane, depending on where you are throughout the corridor. So that's not changing. So we're, we're, not, we're not focusing any uh, work within the center part. That's staying as it is. We're really focusing from the curb line out. That's where all the work that we're proposing is gonna take place. So as you can see, we wanna separate the sidewalk from the roadway. Right now, the sidewalk is pretty tight, close to the curb. We wanna push that sidewalk back, provide an, uh, a buffer area for landscaping, add some aesthetic qualities. That also makes it more appealing um, and more enjoyable for the pedestrian as they're walking through the corridor. You're not right against the curb with cars um, you know, speeding by you. You'll know as we get past the sidewalk, we've got a couple different options, whether it be a grass or a hardscape. So depending on where you are throughout the corridor, we're gonna try and best match what we can um, behind the sidewalk. What, if there's a green space um, or landscaped area, we wanna replicate that and tie into that. If there's a hardscaped area, we wanna be able to tie into that hardscape area, whether it be a, a driveway, um, you know, parking area, et cetera. So it really depends on where you are throughout the corridor and we can answer specific questions um, out, out in the uh, lobby area and if you have a question on what we're doing um, in a specific uh, portion of the project. So as part of the improvements, we wanna get some street trees in. So the, the previous fa uh, phase of the project, the one that was comp uh, recently completed, really added some nice street trees that as they grow up throughout the year, is gonna make a beautiful corridor. We wanna carry that beautification right up through and we've identified some, uh, some species here. So we've got five different uh, types of uh, street trees. And if you feel strongly about using one of these or if you've got a different one in mind, again, that's something that we'd like to hear your input on and uh, tell us what you think about using these or a different type of species within the corridor. We wanna know what you guys think will really beautify the area. So what are those proposed improvements gonna look like? As I had mentioned, we want to get these new detectable warnings in at, at every uh, roadway crossing. Again, so that, that not only visual cue for somebody that's visually impaired, but they also can, uh, can feel that with their cane. Again, a, a, a very clear indicator that they're crossing a, a roadway. So that's very important to get those in. We want to put new high visibility crosswalks in. So the picture on the right is right down at, uh, across from the Hyde Park Antique Center. You can see nice, vibrant, uh, contrasting uh, striping it really stands out so as a motorist is traveling through the corridor you get that visual cue all right I can expect a pedestrian crossing here so we want to get those in where we can at, um, at all the proposed crossing locations so looking at the Park Plaza intersection right now there's no striping out there we're proposing striping on all four quadrants as well as pedestrian activated signals on all four quadrants so as a pedestrian is coming up the sidewalk and wants to either cross Route 9 or Park Plaza or Rogers Place, indicate with, um, by touching the button on the pedestrian signal, the signal will turn, giving them the, the, the verification to cross the road and then continue across. One thing we've added at Park Plaza is this pedestrian refuge island. That crossing is pretty long. So what we wanted to do is provide a refuge if um, somebody cannot make the full crossing in one motion they're able to cross a portion of the the driveway catch your breath there will be a, another reactivation button there hit the button again they'll get another indication to continue the rest of the crossing very safe uh, for a very busy uh, intersection so again we feel this would be a, a great addition and then up at pine woods so this is a New York State DOT proposed project. So they're looking at doing a full signal replacement here. As part of their signal replacement, they're proposing a little bit of sidewalk work and getting new um, handicap ramps in, as well as uh, nice, again, nice vibrant uh, contrasting uh, striping in to uh, alert motorists of where to expect a pedestrian crossing. So this project has been um, in DOT planning for a little while. What we're actually looking at doing through discussions, the town's been very proactive, uh, having uh, a lot of correspondence and discussions with DOT, trying to get that project um, 
in the same time frame that we're going to be completing our project or into our project entirely, DOT will fund it. However, it would be constructed same time, exact same time, our contractor is completing the sidewalk project, in which case makes a very uh, cohesive project at this point um, where, you know, we'll, our sidewalks will be complete. And we'll have the new signal there at the same time. So it's uh, essentially done. Now I want to talk a little bit about the New York State DOT right away acquisition process. <coughs> so with, the, with that process, um, there, there's four main steps. And what we're required to do as part of the project is if we are encroaching on any property, we're required to take a portion of that property. So it's referred to as a strip taking. It could be small as 10 square feet, you know, it could be 100 square feet. We're talking very small parcels, but what that allows us to do is we cannot put sidewalk on somebody else's property because if, if it is on somebody else's property and you have a pedestrian walking down it, then you as the owner cannot allow, <coughs> you have the option of not allowing that person on your property. Not great if you're trying to put new sidewalks in. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that the sidewalk's entirely within the New York State DOT right away. So in some instances, we are required to take some strip takings. Other instances, we may just need to go back on to uh, private property to do grading, whether it be reestablishing um, some turf, whether it be, um, you know, if we're impacting a, a tree or something and we want, the owner wants to get a new tree, to, to complete that work, we have to get, uh, we have to obtain easements. Mm -hmm. So that all falls under this right-of-way acquisition process. So as part of the process, all the property owners that will be impacted will be personally contacted. The, the project uh, and the specific impact to their property will be discussed with them. And then throughout that process, they'll be, up to they'll be kept up to date on where we are in the process, what the next steps are. After the, after the property owner fully understands the impact to their property, an appraisal will be done to value that piece of property that will be taken. Again, it doesn't matter if it's you know, 10 square feet or 100 square feet. An appraisal will be done to value that piece of property, whether it be an easement or an acquisition. As we continue through the process, uh, the, that, that appraisal will then turn into compensation. So that property owner will be compensated, whether, again, whether it's just an easement for grading or if it's actual acquisition and uh, that piece of property will become part of the New York State DOT highway, the property owner will be compensated. And that's referred to the next stage as a, uh, the one offer system. So there's two appraisals are done. Uh, so to make sure that, you know, one, one appraiser comes out, they don't miss something, and that both appraisal numbers, you know, come close to each other. So, so not, not always do they, you know, match 100%, but it gets you a, a, a good gut check. If one, uh, one appraiser says the property's worth, you know, $500, and the next one says it's worth $1,600, well, we got to look at that, you know, what's, what's the difference between those? Um, so once the final appraised value is determined, again, that one offer is made, and then the, uh, a regular closing occurs, and the actual acquisition is uh, completed, whether it be, again, an easement for just a duration. So if it's an easement for construction, there will be a clear duration on that easement. If it's an acquisition, that piece of property would become property of New York State DOT. So that is the, the, the right-of-way process in a nutshell. If anybody has any questions on, you know, a little more in depth, feel free to, to grab me after this. So where are we at in project costs? As you heard, there's federal funding involved. So there's a total uh, construction budget set aside of 695,000. Of that 695,000, 556,000 is coming from uh, the federal government for the project. Now to get that money, the town's required to put up a percentage. So a 20% match. So the town portion is 139,000. So between those two, that equals the 695,000 total available for construction. Our preliminary estimates are 597,000. But since we're still in the very early stages, um, we threw a 15% contingency on there for the unknowns before we're into that detailed design. So that equates to $90,000 grand total of 687,000. So as you can see, right now we are under budget, which is great. So we're getting, proposing new sidewalks, new pedestrian signals, 
um, that 1,800 feet of sidewalk from Park Plaza just up to the firehouse uh, within the budget. So this is, this is a great place to be at at this point. So it gives us some flexibility as we start refining the alternatives. We start incorporating the, the comments that we get from all you folks into the project. We can hone that in, but we feel very confident at this point that we're going to be within budget, which is, which is really great. So what are our next steps? So we're going to incorporate the, the comments uh, that, or questions that we received from you folks tonight. That's going to go into our preferred alternative to start honing that alternative. Then we've got to continue uh, our coordination with all the different federal and state agencies. As you can see here, we've got uh, quite a few. Again, being that we're using federal funding, there's a strict process of a lot of agency coordination that needs to occur to make sure that we're following NEPA, um, SEEKER, which is our uh, federal and state uh, environmental quality reviews. We've got New York State SHPO, making sure that we're not impacting any cultural or, or historic uh, properties within the corridor. And then Fish and Wildlife, Natural Heritage, you make sure that there's no endangered species within the corridor that would be ad adversely affected by the project. So once we're through that, we'll submit our final design approval document. After we get uh, obtained design approval, we will then uh, begin to start creating our design plans. So looking at the schedule, how does that lay out? So we're, we're looking to uh, achieve design approval in March. That'll lead us into our final plans in August. Construction can start in November. You know, once we get our final plans completed, they're out to bid, get a contractor on board. A contractor could really start some of the uh, preliminary site work and then uh, have construction completed in July of 2020. So that takes care of the, the sidewalk project. And again, if anybody has questions, you know, feel free to, to grab us, uh, either myself or Addison after, and we'll uh, answer any of your questions. And again, Pete's got the comment form, so if there's any comments that you'd like to make, again, grab one from him. So I'll talk a little bit about what's proposed with the Hyde Park Lighting Project. So that project starts at uh, the Antique Center and travels north up to just south of Park Plaza. There's a Shepherd Hook uh, light uh, pole in Luminaire proposed for the project. And really we're trying to, to add consistency within the corridor. There's uh, this lighting style within a lot of the businesses already. And through the parking lot, so we're really trying to, to incorporate um, what's already established throughout the corridor and make it more formalized as starting to put that along the sidewalks and then down, uh, down US Route 9. <coughs> so the overall light is 10 foot, 10 inches tall to the top of the pole, and the fixture is 12 feet above the sidewalk. So at that height, it provides a nice low level light, nice aesthetic quality, um, and, and provides the lighting uh, for the sidewalk. Again, making it a more enjoyable walk for a pedestrian traveling through the corridor. So each one of these red dots indicates where a light uh, pole and luminaire are going. So you can see, you know, we tried to keep a consistent spacing of 50 feet where possible. However, there's some constraints, whether it be the, the pond here or, you know, a driveway, business entrance, et cetera. And as we continue further north, just headed up uh, just south of Park Plaza. Again, you can see the, the layout where these light poles are proposed. So this project has been uh, bid. We received four bids. The low bid was 170,000, all the way up to 287,000. Uh, the town is right now um, in negotiations with the, the low bid contractor, um, making sure they're qualified um, to complete the work and that they can complete the work uh, to the specifications that are required. And construction uh, for the lighting project will begin in the spring, this spring and should be completed by the summer. So with that, does anybody have any questions on what you've just seen? Yes? What's that? Yes, yep. 
Ed, would you mind repeating the question just so we can get that on the? Sure. She had a uh, she had a question on the, the type of species for the oh. pear. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. They do not. Nope. They're um, they're. Um, that's one of the things you evaluate as you go through the process. Um, the solar uh, doesn't necessarily fit all applications, and based on the, the light string that is going to be out there, um, an LED. So those are LED lights, um, which is a cost-effective light. Um, not as great as solar, obviously, as being green, but uh, very cost-effective. And based on the number of lights that are being proposed, um, we, we went with a, a, a regular electrical energized light. Yes, sir. I think the last time I tried to cross uh, a road, one of those press a button cross? Yes. My recollection is I had to wait an awful long time, and then when, oh, I'm finally ready to go, oh, it turned so I'm fast on you. Ready. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes, there. Um, a lot of the old style signal systems weren't, um, I guess, as pedestrian friendly as they are today. A lot of times you push the button, you don't even know if it activated, if it's doing anything. Um, so the, the new style, um, you actually get a, a, a beep. So you get a feedback to know that something's actually happening. So you're not just standing there waiting, waiting, waiting. And they're also now designed to um, to a slower speed for pedestrian walking, so it gives you more clearance time to get across an intersection. So, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm familiar with some of the older signals and in, in that you push it, you wait, wait, and then it's like, oh, go, and then you're halfway across and it's like, oh, now I got to sprint. Yes, it's not ideal, not ideal, agreed. Yes, sir. Nope. So if it's um, if it's at a signalized crossing, when you push that button, it'll be timed with the uh, stoppage of the the mainline traffic, so you are able to cross um, with traffic fully stopped. Yes, ma'am. Will any of the new traffic lights and or replacements be uh, solar? I forgot. I'm supposed to repeat all the questions for, for the yes, viewers at home. Mind. Yes. Um, so the question was, are, will any of the traffic signals be solar? And the answer to that is no. Um, so D these are New York State DOT uh, signals, and New York State DOT does not have a policy in place right now to utilize solar uh, traffic signal equipment. So they are um, just electrical um, hardwired in. Yes, sir. So the question was, is there any other funding available for other uh, aesthetic qualities, um, fountains, um, other types of plantings, et cetera? Um, yes, I'll say yes to some extent. So um, there, uh, there are requirements on the funding of what you can use. Um, so with uh, traditional landscaping, bushes, shrubs, grasses, et cetera, um, those would be eligible. Um, fountains would not be eligible. Um, so yeah, the, to use those out of the box, really awesome aesthetic things that you would love to do. Um, unfortunately, the, the funding will not allow you to, to, to utilize that. Ben, I think we should maybe take one more question. Okay. To sure, absolutely. Right here. Yes, sir. I actually have two. Okay. Oh, you got to get clearance. <laughs> 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 I got to get in before they get cut off. Okay. <laughs> That's, go ahead. Also, the, the traffic signal that you talked about by the antique center, like yes. Eats Famous or whatever. Yep. I think since it's been there, I've seen one person actually use that. And I'm thinking, I've, I've seen an awful lot of clothes called down by Dairy Queen and, and in that area. Sure. I'm wondering, I'm sure there was a reason. But to me, it seems as though there's a whole lot more pedestrian traffic crossing there. So I'm wondering if there's a plan to do anything. Sure. So it's a two part question. Um, one was regarding uh, the placement of the pedestrian crossing um, in front of the antique center and then the um, uh, and potentially utilizing another crossing down at the Dairy Queen. And the first question was lighting, lighting um, whether that's going to be continued further north. 
So yes, the town does have uh, in their initiative to continue that lighting. Um, whether that makes this one, uh, the funding available or not in this phase, um, it most likely will not. Um, but well, again, that's, we're in the early stages. We'll see where we come out with final numbers and evaluate that. Um, at a minimum, what we'd probably do is put the, um, you know, appurtenances in for future lighting. So that what was done on the previous project. So under the sidewalk project, kind of was installed across all the driveways um, to, to locations where they could be easily dug up and connected to in the future. So prepping for that future work. So definitely a consideration that the town is looking at doing. Um, as far as the crossing location, so again, New York State DOT has specific requirements on how far crossings can be located. Um, so if there is a signalized crossing, um, they look at how far is a crossing distance to the next signalized location. So the, the location of putting that, that one at, um, in front of the antique center really was based upon what um, was looked at for uh, a desire for pedestrians and where it was projected that they would cross the most. Um, now, as, as development changes and the town starts getting infill, there de definitely will be other additional crossings uh, proposed. And as, you know, again, as growth occurs, you know, it really dictates where pedestrians are gonna, going to, uh, to cross. So in the future, that could be a, uh, a, new, a signalized intersection could be put in there. Again, not knowing what other commercial growth could be put in, but um, that's definitely something that could occur in the future. Great. Okay, so um, Ed, uh, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. And Pete has the uh, question and comment forms that he would like to distribute to people. Um, yes, ma'am. And yep, uh, we look forward to your comments. Uh, we'll keep you posted as they develop. Um, the lighting is, is the yeah, next phase, so we're very excited that. about that. So um, then uh, we're just going to go ahead and move on into the zoning um, uh, update that we have undertaken. And I'll just uh, go ahead and introduce Bonnie Franson from uh, Nelson, Pope, and Borges. And uh, Bonnie has worked with us on other projects, the Crossroads Core Zoning, and has vast experience with de uh, developing codes for small municipalities. So, so welcome, Bonnie, and, and thank you. Small and large uh, municipalities. Yes, so thank you. We're we're glad you're here, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think we're still trying to work out. And uh, actually, the presentation here. Can I just make one announcement too? So we weren't exactly sure how the timing was going to work out. So uh, we do have this public hearing scheduled to dis uh, regarding a stop sign at Green Tree Drive, uh, and so um, that was scheduled for 7:05. We're going to postpone that till uh, Bonnie is done with her presentation till. A bit after, uh, probably that'll be closer to 7:30. So, if anyone is here to make a comment, uh, please bear with us and, and stick around. There you go. Okay. So again, uh, my name is Bonnie Franson. Hopefully, this is working. There we go. And I'm with Nelson Pope and Voorhees. We're an environmental planning consulting firm. Uh, we did assist the town of Hyde Park in the creation of the Crossroads Core Zoning District, which is that area that's up by Albany Post Road and Market Street, uh, intending to create a much more downtown walkable type environment that really built upon its historic precedent um, when we did that rezoning. Uh, so as a result, um, the town board asked us uh, to work with uh, the board to uh, be involved in this zoning process, which was really initiated with the planning and engineering report that was prepared for the overall downtown revitalization uh, process. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the document, there is a planning and engineering report. Uh, for the redevelopment of the town center. It was prepared and it was also adopted as an addendum to the comprehensive plan. As a result, when you have a, a plan that's adopted as your comprehensive plan, any future zoning must be in accordance with that plan. 
Um, just as a reminder to everybody, uh, the recommendations that are in that planning and engineering report, as, and in particular with regard to design, the vision for this area, and uh, potential zoning, uh, really came about from public open house workshops, uh, one which was held on June 19th, 2017. And we did want, want to remind everybody what the takeaways were from that process. And essentially, uh, town participants indicated they wanted to create a unique town center. Uh, key words are that they wanted it to be, uh, they wanted to be pedestrian friendly, uh, have businesses, restaurants, specialty food stores, small shops, and mixed housing options, uh, and community uses such as outdoor event space and farmer's market space. So really, a center that has a lot of vitality to it, a lot of energy to it, where you can visit it as your town center. Um, the vision for the town center must be unique, uh, reflect the area's history, which is very important in the town of Hyde Park, given, um, again, the historic properties here and its history. Uh, be family friendly, well designed, and attractive um, to both residents and visitors to the area. So what came out of this process, again, was um, indication that the town really wanted something uh, beyond just simply rezoning and allowing uses, but something that allows buildings that are going to be attractive and create an, uh, an attractive environment for all those who visit the town center. When the vision statement was prepared for the planning report, and a vision really is how you envision this area 10 to 20 years out. If it were developed in the way that you see, um, that you envision as, as um, the best for the town, uh, this little exercise said, well, what are the five words? What are, what are the words that you would put in a vision statement that would define uh, this particular area? And so you can see, again, the words such as walkable, um, retail, family friendly, community, historic, restaurants, shops, farmers markets, parks, art. Those are all guiding words um, when considering how to zone uh, ultimately the, and prepare land use regulations for this area to achieve the vision. So during the uh, public open house workshops, uh, individuals uh, were allowed to walk around um, to various stations and really provide input into the type of not just land uses but building forms that the town envisioned for this area. And so one important aspect of the zoning process was that the town indicated that housing should be a part of any kind of town center plan. And in particular, um, the responses uh, pointed out uh, apartments over retail, so a, a more traditional downtown environment where you have retail on the ground floor and apartments above. And then you also like the concept of live worked loft space, which again is retail um, artisans involved and living in a particular building. In addition, uh, when the community was uh, asked to look at its preferences for retail and commercial uses, the kinds of images that uh, the community chose were a Main Street environment. Um, you're not looking to recreate the types of commercial centers that have been built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, where really they're standalone shopping centers, where parking is in the front of the buildings, you know, your more conventional centers. But you're really looking to create something that's new, um, uh, a, a different kind of building pattern than what you have now. And also importantly, a lot of people, again, mention the desire for mixed use development, meaning mixing your housing and your commercial spaces together in a more uh, conventional, traditional Hudson River Valley type downtown. There also was a lot of discussion that the town center should include some visitor related tourism type uses, uh, whether that be at outdoor event space, having a farmer's market, again, for both the community, but also um, for visitors, having outdoor shops and small retail shops. These were some of the preferred uh, uses that were mentioned during that public open house uh, process. And again, in terms of design, the community had the opportunity to look at various uh, images of what might be appropriate within uh, this town center. 
And some of the images that you selected uh, really show multi-story buildings, not single story. Uh, in fact, one of the images is up to four stories. Um, set close to the sidewalk. You're not looking for buildings that are set far back with the parking in the front. If you look at the images that you prefer, it's really buildings that are fronting to a sidewalk or a small landscape yard. Um, you seek mixed use buildings. Again, that was very popular commercial and residential. Parking that is screened. Again, we don't want to see you know, vehicles and vehicle access in the front of the buildings. Uh, residential and non-residential buildings designed with appropriate compatible architecture. So the architecture did mean something to the residents. Um, you don't want to see flat, boring facades. You want to see facades that have given due consideration to some of the historic architecture uh, that is here within the town. And so all of these thoughts and public preferences we need to address as part of any comprehensive rezoning effort for this area. So in the 2017-2018 Town Center um, engineering uh, report, there was a general uh, project area boundary that really encompassed uh, Pine Woods down to Van Dam Road, the properties that front on either side. Um, again, there are various images um, that are precedent setting in terms of what you want to see in this area, but ultimately, um, there were other images within the engineering report that really envisioned that this town center was going to be expanded a bit more to the north um, and incorporate additional properties so that it lines up with the Crossroads Core District. That is, again, in the Albany Post Market Street area. Um, again, the planning and engineering report, it did primarily focus on the shopping center area and infill redevelopment. Um, and so when we embarked on this rezoning analysis, we had to do some additional review of the area, the land use and building patterns um, uh, to expand beyond uh, what was really focused on in the planning and engineering report. So as part of this 2018 into 2019 zoning process, we looked at the town center vision that was expressed in the planning and engineering report and we prepared a memorandum that went beyond, uh, again, just really focusing on the shopping areas and the shopping center redevelopment, but really looked at a little bit more holistically uh, properties that were within the area, what should be included in this new zoning district, um, what made sense. And so we looked at things such as zoning boundaries of the existing zones. We reviewed the existing land uses and building patterns. Um, we reviewed that area that's to be sewered. Um, the historic building patterns and themes. Uh, we extensively reviewed um, with this committee many, many, many images of different housing types, different commercial types to really vet and determine what would be appropriate uh, for the town center zone. Um, and uh, the P&E report and the vision memo become a basis for the proposed zoning. Just like the engineering planning report got adopted as an amendment to the comprehensive plan. This vision um, memo will also amend the comprehensive plan to further detail the intent of the zoning that's going to get adopted. So the document that's been prepared um, and their design and development standards for what is now called the Town Core Zoning District has some guiding principles that are key to uh, guiding the planning board, the town board, the ZBA, um, and other officials who are um, tasked with enforcing the land use regulations and the zoning regulations. So these principles include compact mixed use development, a mix of housing styles, types, and sizes with higher density um, within the town center and higher than other areas of the town, Generally, no to narrow front yard setbacks. Again, so you create that downtown walkable environment. Um, greater setbacks for garages and accessory structures. You want those behind the buildings, not in front of the buildings. A human scale building design and configuration. Whatever gets built has to make sense for the town center. It can't be overly large um, for your community. Orientation of buildings to the street. Again, you don't want to see parking oriented to the street. You want to see your buildings um, oriented to the street. 
system of interconnected streets, um, not with uh, the creation of single access points, which ultimately will become traffic problems. We need to have a gridded and appropriately connected system of streets uh, to be able to handle any kind of traffic. Um, streets will have sidewalks, bike paths, um, transit offerings, again, pedestrian amenities and connectivity, which were really addressed um, by GPI in, s in terms of some of the improvements that are envisioned for Albany Post Road and, and the study area. Um, landscaping of parking lots and public spaces, and then, uh, importantly, incorporation of significant historic and scenic features into the site design. Again, looking to our existing buildings for historic precedent. So these are some of the images that were referenced when we were started to put the zoning um, document together. Uh, these are precedent images and they get to some of the preferred building types that the uh, town envisions for this town core area based on scale. Uh, one of the uh, conclusions of the process was ultimately the town prefers to see something that's not larger than three stories. Uh, during the, again, public open house workshop process, um, there were some images of four story, but I think ultimately when we think of the roads and we think of the buildings and the lot sizes, et cetera, um, three stories seem to fit better than four um, within the town. Size, um, there's less concern about size of the buildings. As you can see, row style buildings will end up being longer. Um, we're, we're more interested in the building type and the building pattern than the size itself. Uh, we want the appropriate frontage and relationship to the street. Um, there are frontage requirements that talk about the need to have porches and to have stoops and to have entrances to retail areas that are friendly. Um, it's called the public and private realm and you want to have a relationship um, with each other that rather than having, let's say, blank walls to the street. You need to have that relationship between your building um, in the private realm and your streetscape in the uh, public realm. And then the architecture ultimately is very important. <laughs> so um, this map shows the limits of what is now going to be the proposed town core zoning district. Generally, it's the purplish looking area that's in the center of that map and it extends from about Harvey Street to the north. It includes the parcels that mostly front to Albany Post Road, um, with some additional parcels that are needed to provide some expanded lots um, as the area evolves. Um, it ends at Van Dam Road to the south, and then what is right now the TCHD district, the town um, center historic district, um, will be renamed uh, sorry, not remained, renamed to corridor business. Um, there are three important aspects to the new regulations, and they are this regulating plan, uh, building types, and architecture. So first, the town core is not this ubiquitous one zone where everything is allowed everywhere within it. There is now a regulating plan that has sub areas. And within each of these sub areas, which um, appear in color on this map, you're allowed different building types. One of the takeaways during the process is the town is less concerned to some extent about the uses. They care more about what the buildings are, what they will look like. Again, a very visual type um, zoning uh, um, uh, process. Uh, rather than, again, focusing more on uses. And so the town core is subdivided into these sub areas which regulate specific building types. And so if you're in something called the P1 district, um, which is primarily the frontage along Albany Post Road between uh, uh, Pine Woods going south, that is going to allow different building types than if you're in the PW2, which sits behind it. And it's really to create this downtown environment. Um, that's the intent of these sub areas. Mm -hmm. So within each of these sub areas, we've called out what type of building is allowed within each of the sub areas. And it goes from row style shop front or traditional shop front um, all the way to single family detached dwellings and public gathering spaces. And again, the buildings and where they're allowed depends on what sub area you are within. Mm -hmm. Um, and the vision memo describes how the sub areas evolved and why these buildings are proposed 
within the particular sub areas. This is an example of the building type standards. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with zoning, um, this is more of a form-based code. Um, it considers more the actual form of the building and less so the uses of the building. So here, this is our traditional shop front, and we have um, examples of uh, buildings that would meet that type of building type uh, pattern. Uh, in the images, so there again, this is a guiding document for any developer or land use um, uh, person who wants to come along and develop or redevelop the parcels within the town core area. We have the story and height requirements, and they're actually even by feet per floor. Uh, there are specific dimensions which create a much more authentic, typical downtown than other dimensions. So we even get into the um, the heights of stories. Um, we talk about which of the sub areas this particular building type is allowed within, uh, frontage encroachments, uh, lot requirements, specific standards, again, with regard to um, window patterns, um, the facade, how it should be articulated so that it's just not, just not a, a flat blank um, wall. Uh, so there are many design standards incorporated in this document to ensure that the town gets what it envisioned. Um, I want to. Uh, really call out and um, let the public know that Dutchess County Planning really helped out with putting some of these standards together. Heather Lavonway is right back here. <laughs> and um, she really uh, helped bring this whole document together in terms of its uh, organization. So then the third element, we talked about the town core and its sub areas. And then we talk about the building types that are going to be allowed within the sub areas. Lastly, the architectural patterns are equally as important. And while we don't expect everything to look exactly authentic to its historic precedent, you can have a modern uh, version of this historic precedent. The zoning acknowledges and the design standards acknowledge that there are certain types of architecture that's historic and appropriate for the town because it already exists in the town or it exists in one of the nearby communities. So these are just two examples. There's about eight um, within the design standards. This happens to be Greek Revival and Carpenter Gothic. Um, the architectural patterns discuss that the architecture will draw from historic precedent, but it can be a modern expression of same. Again, we recognize that um, we're uh, in a different uh, century than when a lot of these uh, buildings were constructed. Uh, new construction and rehabilitation should f reflect these traditional architectural patterns. And there are many standards that talk about the massing, the roofing, the preferred uh, materials, the wall um, uh, facade, what they should uh, incorporate in terms of materials. Again, a lot of um, guidance for the boards who ultimately will be implementing the zoning regulations as they review applications. So all of these design and development standards are incorporated into this document, which, document which will be an attachment to the zoning. Um, it's referred to as the design and development uh, standards for the town core zoning district. Um, at this point in the process, um, the map, the, there is a use table still for the zone. Um, the design and development standards uh, have all been put together in draft form, and we're beginning the zoning review and adoption process. Um, importantly, sort of the kind of a last comment with regard to these design and development standards is we acknowledge that there's going to be a transitional period. Um, these designs, uh, this type of development intensity and density really relies on having sewers. And so there is a building waiver process until such time that the sewers are in place, acknowledging that it may not be possible uh, when a building needs to accommodate sewer syst um, septic systems on the lot, the exact pattern we may not be able to fulfill right away. Um, also, there are institutional buildings. There may be a building which simply doesn't fit one of these building types. Um, 
that also um, would go through the building waiver process. So I think these design and development standards have been created, again, recognizing where we are in the process and recognizing that there has to be a transitional time period to be able to enact them. But even if the building can't be placed exactly where you want it on the lot, there are other standards that still should be followed, including architectural um, and other standards. Um, at this point in the process, the town is really seeking your input. This is a draft. Um, certainly, um, the public's comments and your thoughts as far as um, what are in these standards are, are being sought um, to make it a better document. Uh, and we welcome your questions with regard to the, the proposed owning. Thank you. Thanks. Bonnie, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Mm. So I, uh, obviously, yeah, we're going to have some um, uh, some Q and A here. Uh, it's a lot to digest. <laughs> There's a lot of content here, and we'll have that up on our website so that people can take a look at their convenience to really go through it. So, but uh, you know, please do feel free to ask general questions now. Um, specific questions, we'll try to address at a different point. But yeah, please. Um, yeah, sure. So the question uh, is, what is the relationship and impact of the sewer line? So at this point in time, much of the town core district um, doesn't have sewer. And so to be able to accommodate development, uh, development right now will have to accommodate a septic system, an in-ground system. And so because of the requirements, um, health department requirements, um, separation distances from other um, Again, just health department requirements for separation between buildings, you know, wells, et cetera, although I think this is mostly public water. Um, it may result in the pattern that's desired really not being met. And we have to be uh, pragmatic while um, we're in a phase where the sewers aren't in place yet. Um, and that's the purpose of this building waiver process. Or to the building waiver and the septics? Um, no, it's just a generalized building waiver. And as a, an applicant comes in and proposes an application, they will need to make proof to the planning board that they can't meet the standard. So it's not an automatic, you know, you get to waive these requirements. It's something that the planning board has to make certain findings before they can waive it. Any other questions? Yes. yes, Emily. So what's, what's good about having so much specificity in your zoning? Because I, I think that's, mm -hmm. sometimes people yeah. think, well, that's a lot right. of requirements, but what, what's the benefit of that? Well, I think the benefit, I know um, having represented developers and, and people who come in as applicants, sometimes the standards are very generalized. And as a result, when they are generalized, they may feel that a planning board is asking them for um, to, to design a project in a certain way, and they ask why, because they don't see it in a document, essentially. And here, it really takes away that guessing game. Um, a developer who comes in to build will know exactly what they're allowed to build. Um, and certainly, these particular standards are not looking to limit development. They're actually looking to regulate what it looks like. And as you can see from the images, we're not talking about small buildings. We're talking really about creating uh, a beautiful, traditional downtown within especially um, the Pine Woods uh, and Albany Post Road intersection. And then as you move out from it, which is why we have these sub areas, it starts to, the density intensity starts to um, uh, transition down to the point where you get again to the single family neighborhoods. You don't want the downtown row building set up against, you know, right next to certain neighborhoods because it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, these zoning standards also acknowledge that um, the desire to keep some of these historic buildings that you see on Albany Post Road, they may not be identified as being on the National Register or in a historic district. They're not your you know, Vanderbilt mansion, but yet they are from the 1800s. And they do have 
um, a beauty to them and an authenticity to them that the standards recognize and want to retain even if they get redeveloped. So the zoning really acknowledges that as well. Uh, yes, I'll take first. Yes. So, so the, the actual concept is called form-based code. Um, there's a form-based codes institute. Some communities, uh, I can, there's a town of Malta has a form-based code. It's upstate New York. Um, there are definitely many communities that are putting in place form-based codes where they feel that they want to regulate um, based on building type uh, rather than uses when they want to create a particular aesthetic. Uh, a, a particular building pattern. So yes, there are. Um, it's just a different type of zoning. Um, you can implement it for specific sections of your town, or some towns will um, implement it throughout the entire town. But in this case, it's really being implemented for the town core zoning district. And you know, as time goes on, and as the town envisions changing other zones if they choose to, they may want to implement this elsewhere in the community. But for the time being, this is important specifically for the town core, given its um, vision and the objectives that the community has expressed. Um, yes. Yeah, in general. I, I think to some extent, um, you know, we all know Amazon and, and the large uh, retailers online are taking away some of the local retail um, market. Um, and yet, there's also another planning pattern, which is people want to go back to town centers. They want to go back to hamlet centers, village centers, and they want to have experiences, um, especially um, younger adults. Um, they want to have experiential environments where they can go to the restaurant, they can go to a movie, they, they want to be out and about. And so the two trends are kind of going against each other. So I think, you know, ultimately I think there's still a need for retail and still a need for these type of spaces, especially those that are gathering type spaces. Um, and the development standards are, um, flexible because they also allow not just a row style building, you know, with the commercial and the apartments, but they also allow multifamily. They're also allowing townhouses depending on the sub area. So this isn't just intended to be all retail. It's really intended to accommodate a mix of housing and retail, which was precisely what the public had um, envisioned as part of the 2017 open houses. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I th if if you can I sure. jump in on that one? Sure. Uh, one of the requirements that we put in is that anyone that's developing a large site needs to have a master plan for that site so that it's not just bit by bit, but that they, they are planning for things like how traffic would move behind the buildings or through the site. So I, I, I think as individual properties come forward, that would be developed, yeah. Right. I think you're going to look at it um, on the west side, um, just because it's narrower. Um, you may get more of an, a service alley. Um, parking may need to be um, provided in a shared manner, which will be important. Um, and so there's going to have to be flexibility in the parking requirements to accommodate this, making sure that there's sufficient parking, um, but that we're not over parking. Um, but I think on the east side, if you look even at the revitalization plan, there was talk of a, somewhat of a parallel, at least access way, driveway, that would provide alternative ways to exit um, the town center area. So it's part of the planning process, and the planning board will look at those opportunities as they get applications to review. Yes? 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, just to mm -hmm. remind everyone, this is just the beginning of the local law process. Mm -hmm. There will be ample time and lots of time to provide comments and encourage people to take a look at the plan and the zoning on the website. And, uh, you know, we'll be setting a public hearing um, later on in the meeting tonight. Uh, so, yeah, we, you know, it's a lot to absorb all at once. So we welcome your comments and, and look forward to them. And, you know, as Bonnie mentioned, it is a draft document. And um, when exposed to other minds, it often ends up a much better document. And so uh, we look forward to that. So, um, Bonnie, do you have any final comments? No, just this? thank you all. Yeah, thanks, everyone. So, um, thank you, Bonnie. Thanks. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and ask if people want to take a break. We're going to have a very short public hearing. And then come on back in, in 10 minutes for uh, the sewer portion of our presentation. And there are comment forms also. We're going to go ahead. Thanks. OK. All right. So. Um, May I have a motion to open the public hearing I'll for local law number B? Second it. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And um, Madam Clerk, would you please You're go okay, ahead Barbara. and read the public hearing notice? Please take notice that the Hyde Park Town Board has scheduled a public hearing on the adoption of Local Law B of 2019 entitled a local law to amend section 104-16A1 of the Town of Hyde Park Code to add a stop sign at the terminus of Green Tree Drive South at the point of its intersection with Green Tree Drive North and Hemlock Lane for February 25th, 2019, 7.05 p.m. Any person desiring to be heard on the adoption of said local law shall be given an opportunity to do so at said public hearing. A copy of said local law shall be posted on the town's website and shall be available for inspection at the town clerk's office during normal business hours. By order of the Town Board of the Town of Hyde Park, dated January 28, 2019, Hyde Park, New York, Donna McGrogan, Town Clerk. Well, thank you. Uh, so would anyone like to speak on this local law? Um, we did gather information from our highway super and our police chief, uh, as well as residents' uh, input to develop the law. And um, we certainly would like to hear anyone's comment if they have it. Okay. Uh, Hold on, we'll go. No, good. No, so, all right. So with that, then, uh, may I have a motion make, to close the public I make that motion. Second. And all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Perfect. So um, we'll wait another minute or two for people to return for the sewer so portion. Yeah, I'll yeah, gather. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm actually going to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, oh, Kurt, yeah. Kurt. Oh, my God. Seven. He, uh, yeah. When we first moved up here to some, put the some neighborhood, uh, we oh, okay. bought a house in Clinton Court's big farm. And we had a guest cottage in the back of that. And Kurt lived there. Oh, when we bought there. the house, we inherited Kurt. He was oh, living there. Oh, cute. <laughs> Quite a guy. So we became very good friends with him. Yeah, he's yeah, a smart he guy. Great. He and I spent a lot of nights drinking some I scotch. He's a he renaissance loves, man. He loves yeah. scotch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just knew him because I lived here. Yeah. 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 Here's a sister. Yeah. So if I see nice short or she's in the in the headlights. Would stop the light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a term. So let's see. A couple of ideas. So supposed to get you a copy of the the former uh, map plan report who wanted that somebody wanted the old okay, like, okay I'll get it tomorrow the old last call for <laughs> sewer <laughs> last call for sewer I like that Ailey
that appointed chief today. What? Do you want to stand up here? Oh, sure, yeah. Get on her shoulder. Sure, no, I'm happy. Get on Don't forget the mic. All right, everyone who wants to hear about sewer, back in the room. Yeah. Woo! Okay. Sewer yeah, cheerleader. Yeah. Always wanted to be a cheerleader. Now's my chance. You weren't? Okay. So, you want to start? Sure. Oh, I guess I need to figure out. So, we wanted to give you a little overview on the, the sewer project. Um, we didn't um, ask our consultants to come down tonight, but we are continuing to work with Delaware Engineering, who many of you have heard present before. They're uh, sewer experts, and they've been working with us throughout this process. Um, but, you know, this is a pretty brief presentation, so rather than have them come down again, we thought we could cover it. Um, <laughs> so just to review, okay, downtown initiative. Um, you know, everything you heard tonight that Bonnie spoke about, um, all the, the vision that people have for what types of um, buildings and shops and, and restaurants and such that you'd like to see in the downtown, um, that will all be a lot easier to accomplish if we have a sewer system. Um, just for the simple reason that if each property has to have its own septic system, you can't really have things built up close to each other because a lot of the land is, is dedicated to septic systems. So um, that's why the sewer is, is really an important piece of this puzzle. And it's something that Hyde Park has been trying to achieve for decades. And I really think we're, we're very close right now and I'm hoping that it goes forward. Um, so the, the sewer that we're looking at, uh, this isn't an exact map. There is an exact map out in the lobby if you wanna look at it parcel by parcel. But just generally, it covers the Route 9 corridor from a, approximately Quality Inn up to just north of um, the uh, Market Street crossroads. So pretty much the area between the entrance to Vanderbilt down to the Quality Inn. And you know, again, why do we need a sewer? Uh, a few points. Um, first of all, to support water intensive businesses like restaurants and hotels, and also multifamily housing like apartments and condos. Um, all of those things are hard to do when you need a, a big septic system to support them. Um, it allows each property be, to be put to a higher use if the land doesn't have to be reserved for septic systems. And it'll support the dense redevelopment that, um, that creates the vibrant downtown that, that we have been talking about for a while now. Um, and really right now, a lot of properties are being held back by that lack of sewer. Uh, the Dodge dealership people have, re have inquired about it and when they find out that they would have to put in a whole septic system, they're just not interested. Um, other properties are limited as to what they can do or how they can use their land because of not having um, a, a big enough septic system. And if we did have a sewer, then when someone wants to come in and develop, they just have to hook up. They wouldn't have to go to the health department and go through that whole process. Yes. So uh, actually today I met with one, um, a, one of the major property owners in this vicinity, and the first 20 minutes of our discussion, and Pete was there too, I would say was really dedicated to the difficulties that he faces getting uh, his properties approved. Uh, going through the Department of Health process is onerous and uh, the standards have increased, requiring a lot more land that was uh, than did prior when they were actually being used. He also talked about uh, the reality that if a property has been vacant for a year or more, that they have to uh, go through a very lengthy process. and. Consequently, a lot of the buildings can't be reused at all. So I think when you look at properties like the Mel Carney building, that was the former Row building uh, that once housed a number of doctor's offices and various other uh, entities, they can no longer use that because they need to be able to expand their septic by 50%. So uh, consequently, it is a way to address the empty building problem that we have here. And it really does get to the, the central 
central uh, to the core reason why these properties are empty because it's actually illogical of course um, all the property owners they don't want to have to pay taxes and uh, uh, upkeep and yet still not have tenants so it's a disconnect and we are getting to the heart of it by uh, providing this uh, central uh, sewer district that's the goal so I, as Emily said too, and uh, Bonnie, our code, it's not really just designed purely for commercial uh, because we do need that flexibility uh, based on this changing retail environment. And so uh, the, the property owners, business people that we met with this morning, they, they really provided an interesting fact, which is they um, uh, six years ago had um, 600 restaurants um, in various malls and, and next year they uh, don't they plan to have none so that's really the malls are dying uh, that's very clear so we have to have different uses and um, expanded uses that will still require the services of a town cent a centralized sewer district but it's not going to be the same that it was in the 1950s or 60s so uh, you know the sewer is going to in addition to allowing those retail uses uh, allow for the dense um, dense housing options that the smaller families are looking for I mean we recognize that demographic change as well that it's a smaller family size less children uh, an aging population we're all looking for smaller units that possibly we don't have to mow the lawns or do those things for <laughs> so uh, this really does kind of uh, facilitate that and also you really do need people uh, to uh, to go to your restaurants to go to your commercial establishments and that this also addresses that so I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> so our progress so far, um, about a year ago, last, not quite a year ago, we finished up the process with Delaware Engineering um, doing the, the engineering report for the town center, uh, which included it, the visioning sessions and the planning and zoning recommendations and, and the sewer plan. And um, all of those things were done in concert, which allowed us then to develop uh, more detail on the sewer plan based on knowing what kind of build out might happen in the town center. Um, so what we've done from there, I'll go through a few steps, but I, I think a lot of what we've done in the, in the past nine months or so is kind of address a lot of what I'll call the what abouts. You know, what about this? What about that? Why haven't we thought about this? And we've kind of gone down a lot of roads and made sure that they weren't the right one and that we're on the right track. And we're really confident that we are on the right track. We thought about, you know, Bellfield is developing now. Is there, would it make more sense to join the two together? And we actually studied that and we looked at it and it doesn't doesn't make sense to do that. Um, it wouldn't be more cost effective for either party. Um, we looked at this new Saki facility that's coming online. What about joining up with them? Again, it didn't make sense. So, um, you know, I think through this, the, the last few months, we've really honed this and feel confident in the system that we're proposing here. And, uh, and just mm -hmm. to interrupt, we also looked at another what about is what if we include all the residential right. uh, development and would that bring the cost down? And it was surprising that it actually didn't. So so yeah. uh, as well as that we have very good circumstances on the uh, west side of nine for septic systems. So that's working fine for the majority of the properties. So again, that was another another trail that we followed down and explored uh, till, till its conclusion. And we keep coming back to this core area, which is what uh, people have really decided before us as well. I mean, I see Bob Linville's here. Uh, you know, I know you worked on it in a very dedicated way. And again, I think it was pretty much the same focused area. Mm -hmm. And then there are other uh, factors that <coughs> influence the cost, which is one is the National Park Service. Uh, the, the federal properties don't contribute uh, to a tax, to any taxes uh, they're prohibited from. So there are, for all these reasons, we keep coming back to this, this boundary that we've established. Yeah. So some of the things that we've done um, since the planning and engineering report was complete, um, the town has selected a treatment plant location. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. We've finalized the district boundaries. Um, we've projected costs for individual property owners, um, which we're, we're fine tuning right now. Um, we've hosted three stakeholder meetings, um, invited everyone, there are about 110 parcels that would be in the district, invited them all to come in. Um, and Aileen and, and Pete have 
uh, spent a lot of time talking with individual property owners, um, yeah. a tremendous yeah. amount of time, lot of time, you know, just really making sure yeah. everyone understands and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very important part of this process is the public education and really getting feedback and uh, um, talking with individuals. And I see one, one nice gentleman is here and had a very positive conversation with him. And it's really interesting to me how, uh, you know, people that have um, properties in other locations are, it's so clear to them the value of the sewer that uh, because, in fact, the gentleman I spoke with today said he really didn't understand the implications of buying a property in Hyde Park without having sewer. So uh, it's, it, it really cannot be um, over overvalued in terms of um, your your current uses, how you're going to develop it, and how you're going to rent it, how you're going to um, uh, uh, subdivide it, perhaps. But you know, when it comes down to it, it's really going to be about property values too. Uh, you know, one of the people I spoke with, um, you know, she was concerned because she didn't want to pass the cost on to her tenants. She had two tenants, and she didn't want to increase their rent. And that's, you know, completely. I understand that. But I did say to her, you know, but someday you want to retire, right? And mm -hmm. when you do want to retire, that property is going to be worth much more. So if you just take a look at our, our values in Hyde Park and you compare them with values in other communities like uh, Fishkill or East Fishkill or Rhinebeck or Wappingers, you'll see that we do not, that there's an inequity there. And a lot of that is because we just don't have the ability to command higher rents because we have a low economic vibrancy and also because it's so complicated for anyone to uh, to have their wastewater treatment so you know for all these factors it's really kept Hyde Park on this very low economic vitality uh, measure and one of the things that I think that was very interesting that our consultant brought out uh, is that we used the uh, current water usage to establish the O and M cost, the cost for um, the uh, operation and maintenance of the system, and she was really mm. stunned about the low water usage that we have in Hyde Park. Mm. It's just it indicates that even if we have an office building, we might only have one person in that office building because the water the water usage is incredibly low. So uh, that's just a very strong indicator of the overall vibrancy of our community. So uh, again, that's. That's why we need sewer. <laughs> so just a little on the treatment plant. Um, the location that we're looking at, and um, this really seems like the, we looked at a number of locations. This one seems ideal in a lot of ways. It's the very north edge of the Pinewoods Park. Um, when you come into Pinewoods, you come in at the south end, and that's where the playground and the, the field and um, a lot of the facilities are. But the park actually goes all the way up to Market Street. And so there's a, a spot there where the um, engineers recommended that you could tuck a treatment plant sort of um, into the hill there and um, discharge right to the Carmelville Creek. It'd be extremely clean water, um, high treatment standards. It's called a membrane bioreactor system. Um, and it's the whole treatment system is enclosed within a building. Um, these pictures on the left are some uh, buildings that Delaware Engineering has, has built to, in, to house treatment plants in other locations. Um, so, you know, they're, they're enclosed, they're quiet, they don't smell, um, it's modern, and it seems like a great location um, that the town already owns. Uh, a little bit on the costs. Uh, the, the system that we're looking at is about $18 million altogether. Um, we've already gathered 5.3 million in, um, in grants and, and cash contributions. So we're, we're starting from a very strong position, having, uh, having that much already contributed towards the system. That's pretty unusual, and I think it, it's uh, very beneficial for us. Um, the, remainder to, uh, uh, the remaining amount to construct the system would need to be bonded by the sewer district and um, it would be assessed to be paid back by the property owners within that district. So um, none of it is paid for by the town at large. That's not legal. It's paid for by the property owners that, um, that have access to the sewer system. Um, 
and there is the possibility that we could get some additional um, funding, but only after the district is formed. We've pretty much, <laughs> we've pretty much shaken every possible tree and gotten what we can um, without having a district. Once there's a district in place, there is potential for something called the Water Infrastructure WIA grants through the state, and there's also reduced interest rates that the state offers that isn't exactly a grant, but um, because it lowers the interest rate, it lowers the total payback cost. Um, so, you know, people have said, well, why, why can't the whole town contribute somehow? Why does it have to be borne by the property owners? And, you know, my answer to the, it's, first of all, it's just not legal for the, the to charge the, the town taxpayers at large, nor are we sure that the town taxpayers would want that. But um, in a sense, the public is contributing through the state and county grants that we've gotten. That, that represents um, the, the, higher level government saying, yeah, this does benefit a, a greater population besides your business district. And that's why um, someone was here from Senator Serino's office. She's gotten some funds for this. And um, we've gotten other funding also through the state. Um, so that's, you know, that's the public's contribution towards it. Um, and, you know, I think it's just important to remember that those grants, they, None of them is, well, only except for the Bellfield contribution. All the grants that we've gotten are, are promises of money. They're not actual money. We don't have the money. So if we don't act on this now, if, t if time goes by, and those grants are just basically going to evaporate. So right. it makes this a moment in time for Hyde Park to take advantage of the funding we have and the, ready to, the design ready to go. So the next steps, right now we're refining the costs. Um, we got some, some better data on water flows, and so we're refining the, the cost numbers to provide to individual property owners. Um, I think it's also going to go up on the website. Yeah. Um, the, the website, hpdowntown.com, has information about all the stuff you've been hearing tonight. Um, the, let's, so after we refine the costs um, and meet again with the property owners, then the next step will be that the town board will consider the map plan and report and um, adopt the map plan and report, which is basically a statement of what the district is and what it costs. Then the next step is to have a public hearing and then the town board would vote to form the district. Um, after the town board votes to form the district, um, there can be a referendum, and what we decided was that in the interest of, um, of transparency and um, making it, you know, d determining what the public really wants, that, that there, will be the, there will be a referendum vote, and each, um, each property owner in the district will get one vote, um, and if a majority of them vote in favor, then the district will form. And then it's a simple majority of the property owners, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if they vote to form the district, then um, they'll go forward with the design and construction from there. Yeah. So that's the, that's the outlook on the sewer. Um, can certainly take some questions. Lori, yeah. Um, I know you're having meetings with all the property owners. What's, what is the feedback that you're getting? Is it mostly positive or is it a uh, so slight 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 I would say uh, it's mostly positive, but uh, the implications for people that have the larger parcels uh, that are currently undeveloped, they have great concerns. Um, they're going to be uh, paying a fairly significant amount with property that is undeveloped at this time. And uh, so, you know, we, have, we would like to try to work with them on an individual basis. Maybe there's a possibility for them to subdivide their property and take some of it out of the potential district. But, you know, I've had very good conversations uh, with a number of people who are very excited about it and you'll see that if you uh, if you take a look at the way it's been um, uh, distributed that there are a lot of properties that will uh, have a burden that is very doable so um, so we're getting mixed feedback you know and it's this is part of the process it's the publication education process and working with people directly Well, th there's a formula based on their acreage and their frontage uh, that was used to determine it. Uh, and then yet, though, that's for the capital cost because the costs are divided into two, uh, two groups. One, your capital cost to 
pay for the infrastructure, and then there's the part that's based on your usage, your O&M, your operation costs. And so uh, with that, the uh, currently vacant properties don't have any O&M uh, projected at this time, but if there is an improvement on the property, there is a way to assign a value there for that O&M. But uh, so that is how it is determined. Yeah, the benefit to doing to uh, assigning the um, the capital cost based on the parcel and not based on what's built on it is that um, if if you decide to invest and build more on the parcel, then you're you're getting all the benefit and not having to pay any more for the sewer. So the idea is that it's um, it's an incentive for people to make the the most use of their parcels. And we're using a formula that our comptroller is was a comptroller in uh, Carmel for 30 years. And he used that to develop um, a number of sewer districts, actually. And so he, he, they have found this to be very fair and equitable. And so that's why we're using this particular formula. So yes. Oh yeah, it's it'll all be uh, through. Again, it's from basically Linden Lane down to uh, to Williger. Yeah. yeah, that's. Uh, well, we have the projected cost for the town, f for their part. Is that your question? Well, I'm just. Who would be paying for the connection to the town hall? All the, the town budget. Yeah, the yeah. taxpayers. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but yeah, we're refining it. It'll be on the website, so sure. So did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Emily, have you done a, an economic assessment of the, of the impact of going with the sewer system and what that could do for Hyde Park economically from a tax base, et cetera? Well, they've looked at how that's affected other communities right. and the, the um, property values go up, the, um, the economic activity goes up. Um, I don't have numbers for what could happen in Hyde Park, but yeah, it's pretty for universal. For you or for, uh, well, it's significant. I, I know that uh, that's a good question for Mary Beth um, from Delaware, uh, Bean Coney from Delaware, um, because she, they've done, I don't know, 20 some districts yeah. throughout the New York State. And um, I, we haven't actually done a full analysis, but she can speak experientially to the transformation in so many villages. Um, and one of their projects that they worked on was uh, Saratoga, which um, it's pretty uh, interesting to think of Saratoga as a depressed community, but it, it really was. It was. And so, uh, you know, with their changes, with their the sewer and their other um, changes that we're working on as well, the pedestrian improvements, it's, it's very vital and vibrant. And um, so I think that's partially uh, a, a, a reference point for us. But I think we can really look around our own Hudson Valley community and see the difference. I mean, if you, you, know, if you imagine going uh, you know, on Route 9 from Poughkeepsie then up to Rhinebeck and then we have this, you know, voided area where uh, uh, we have vacant properties that are just, unre it's unrealized potential, but yet we have these incredible assets. We have the, um, the tourist sites that are the most visited in the entire county uh, and they're anchoring our town on either side. You know, we have the Culinary Institute and yet what we don't have is the the um, number of businesses that people want to stop at, right. and that's and certainly the property owners would love to see that. <laughs> I mean, but yet they can't do it with the without the infrastructure. And there was a market analysis done as part of the initial <coughs> study that showed you know tremendous unmet uh, demand for uh, restaurants, retail, uh, etc. So yeah. Is the question is that a thirty-year bond? Or thirty-year bond. Yeah. And a couple years. A couple years. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. you have the full design, uh, the bidding, the competitive bidding right. process. That's Pete's here. Yeah. yeah. A num Yeah. Did you? Is so that right? Is that yeah. right? <laughs> Pete. He's got Larry. Pete said so yes. Oh. Yes to all that. Yes. <laughs> How long? How long does it take? take? goes into effect and then they're waiting 
So you, they're paying that while you're waiting. To it's a good question, and the bond starts when you when you need to bond. So um, what we're hoping is that some of the the funds that we've gotten um, in advance that we would be able to mm -hmm. use that up front for some of the engineering, so that we wouldn't have to bond, you know, until as late a point as possible, so that you I'm don't that use up the thirty years. sure about that. Sure I don't exactly know if that's have. the order. Yeah, but we, maybe we should have had the engineers come yeah. down, but we can but, certainly get you more details but on the, that. But, you know, we did uh, receive this $1.25 million contribution from Belfield uh, for specifically assigned to the sewer, and that is a resource that we're going to be able to use to draw upon for the design services and, and uh for this interim period. And I, I don't know, Pete, is it typical for people to get construction loans or is it typically that you bond the entire, the full amount right away? Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but. Well, I'll do, do sign language. You don't have to. Yes, you would actually bond the entire amount. Yes, okay. Right up in front. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry for my Peter, <laughs> Peter. Sure. Yeah, when I take on a project, I like to size it up by what happened to Pete? putting limits on it. What happens if I go too little, what happens if I go too big? And when I know that, then I know how to steer it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just uh, wondering if we've taken the same uh, perspective, we know that we do nothing, deterioration, dilapidation. If we do too much, we might end up changing the character of things in ways that uh, we had thought about because we're, we're shooting to do better. So the question is, can we keep control of the beast so it's steered to the balanced middle? Good. Well, I, I I think we have kept control of it. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we do get a lot of calls from people throughout the town. Can I connect? I've had, you know, people from the arbors or different, and on 9G, yeah, on 9G yeah. and you know, and I think the idea really is to keep it contained in the center. Uh, but there is a require. You have to have enough people paying in to make it worthwhile. You can't. Uh, because you have to share that burden of the operation and maintenance cost. And that, that when it's distributed amongst a lot of people, it's helpful, okay? It, there's, there's benefit in numbers in that regard. So, uh, but I think that we have really a focused system that we're doing that. But, uh, so. Yes, I just wanted to say that Rhinebeck has a store, I believe, right. in its center. Yep. And they needed it. And they needed it to be Yes, and, and as uh, uh, um, we just discussed, Rhinebeck has a, has a commercial sewer district in their center, and that enables them to have the restaurants, uh, the, st the storefronts in that compact vision. So it worked for them. Yeah, yeah. There's more than one sewer system in Rhinebeck. Um, it's my understanding there's one, but then they have a connection that goes out into the town, out to like where the fairgrounds are. That's my understanding, but I think it's still the one system. But it's also my understanding they're pretty much maxed out um, on their sewer. And, you know, that's another issue that, um, you know, we're starting fresh. This is going to be contemporary equipment at, at the cutting edge. And so it's not going to be um, in need of constant upgrading which having had experience with our yeah. eight water and sewer districts, I'm very familiar with how <coughs> expensive that is. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of sewer systems out there throughout the county that are uh, close to, there may not be failing, but they're in they're tremendous close. need of yeah. upgrading. And we won't need to do that here because it's going to be uh, cutting edge brand new, brand new equipment. Yep, we're paying a lot up front, but what happened in, in some districts in particular uh, the operation and maintenance costs became very high for those districts because there was constant repairs needed. Yeah. And this is going to be very predictable. Uh, the capital costs are going to be very predictable as the operation and maintenance because it is a new, it's new equipment and it will be, uh, we'll be able to uh, project what those exact costs will be. 
but um, yeah, Rhinebeck, uh, it's, it's kind of funny for Hyde Park, you know, yeah, we, we all love to go to Rhinebeck, and people always say, oh, you want to be Rhinebeck, well, we actually don't, we just want to be uh, Hyde Park, the best Hyde Park, yeah. Hyde Park we can be, but I think we all agree, we'd like to have a few more restaurants and cafes, and uh, definitely to get rid of some, the empty buildings, that's, that's what it's about. Supervisor in the back here. Yes, yes sir. I guess I was just wondering if there was a way for people that don't live inside of the district to possibly find support. Um, um, that's I just like on a volunteer, voluntary basis. No, no, no. Can I answer that for you, Supervisor? Sure. Yeah. Go to every business and say, I live in the town. I want to support a, any business that comes in here. Please get the sewer. Uh, they, need to, they need to hear that. Um, there, there's a lot of businesses here, uh, in my opinion, that um, they're, they're set in their old ways um, and they need to understand that the town needs and deserves and wants more um, and with sewer they can have higher density and then they can get more restaurants they can have more wet uses um, so the more the business owners hear from the town's people I think the better it is I mean they hear from the supervisor um, every town council here um, we're beating a drum saying listen this is what we need this is what we need and we've had numerous amount of meetings here and everything that you heard about the zoning tonight about what the townspeople want is what you guys said that you want so the business owners or the property owners need to know that hey guys we really want this and we'll support you get the sewer so I think that's a great question so uh, and a great response and so also coming to our meetings and letting us know that you support it and you appreciate it i think that's that's great uh, um, i think that one of the things that we've always focused on is this common ground and we all agree we need a we need a better commercial district and this is how to get right. it it's pretty clear so right. thanks for that, that question. and just one other comment if you don't mind a lot of people would always say boy the town is just impossible for it to get businesses and you know the town board doesn't want businesses to come in hmm. that is so not true it's really it, it's sewer that's what really stops all this from happening I mean I know that you spoke to a property owner today that is putting millions upon millions upon millions with new buildings but yet you have that old Amish building that they can't do anything with until we get sewer right it's not the town holding them back it's the sewer project so Hopefully they can all band together and get this thing done. <laughs> well, yeah, so uh, John and then Fran. Yeah. Um, to piggyback on that last question, uh, as you get this built and as people begin to see the value of having a central sewer system, um, it, it would be nice to have a process or a mechanism to allow adjacent properties to be able to um, tap in. No, they could, they could. Uh, is that a possibility? Well, there's always uh, the option to have tenants to the district uh, that they can, uh, you know, make an appeal to the town to connect, and then there's a discussion on what that charge would be. Um, you know, that happens pretty regularly. Uh, that happens over on 9G. We have a couple of properties that are tenants to the Poughkeepsie district. Uh, so that is some always a discussion that can be had uh, later on if there were properties that wanted to combine. But, um, you know, we're building the uh, plant uh, with excess capacity um, for what is, exists right now. It's predicated on a better, a bigger build out. So, uh, you know, that would be a discussion that would have to happen at that time, too. And if I could just add one more, it's not just businesses. If you belong to any church that's along Route 9, you know, tell your, you know, tell the, the deacon or the pastor or the board members that you're for it uh, because they get a vote as well. So, you know, the churches are very important to, to have your voice heard within those uh, buildings as well. We can take another maybe yeah, one, or one or two, two but then uh, we have a, a meeting night, so. still. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, that the was Yep, I actually have. I went on the tour. In, down in Putnam County. A cu I went to a couple that Delaware Engineering designed and built. Yep. Is it at, where is it in town? Um, oh, shoot, you're putting me on the spot. 
I could tell you later. I'd have to look back at my notes. It was like a year ago. I don't remember the, yeah. But I know that one of them is in Wyndham, I, I, the one of those photos. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. At least one of them was one of the ones in Putnam County that yeah. I went to. Yeah. They're entirely enclosed in a building. So that's, and it's this membrane bioreactor technology. So it's, it's just, it's not really what you envision as an old time <laughs> super plant. It's pretty modern. But uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, yeah, it's, and again, that's ref referring back to the modern um, uh, technology that we'll have, as opposed to some other locations that do not have that. I but just also wanted to. I, I realized before that I was I, just on a personal note. I've been using the uh, the pronoun we, and I just want to point out I'm not on the town board anymore. So you're probably thinking like, what's she saying we for? Because yeah. it's not my. So just so you know, I'm still continue. I'm no longer on the town board, but I'm continuing to work on the downtown initiative projects as, as a, a volunteer. volunteer. And everything that decisions that are made are all going to be made by the town board. So I just wanted to clarify that. Of course I have it that I still say we. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for continuing to work on this. I mean, as a volunteer, I, I mean, we've really invested a, a tremendous amount of our time and heart and soul in it. So uh, it's, I know that we both want to really see this come to uh, fruition. Yes. So um, I don't, was there one more question? Or, right. Yep, Jack, a uh, question. Uh, I was uh, just wondering about the, uh, about the limits. Uh, it kind of uh, dovetails into the uh, sidewalk. Why isn't uh, the uh, idea of conditioning uh, the state, the DOT, to upgrade Route 9 from Pine Woods to Market Street to a standard that's at least the equivalent of what of the geometry of the road that's to the south. And at the same time, I know it's been done, so I was involved in several projects. The state will uh, marry up with a municipality on a particular project like this. And while there's road construction going on, the sewer lines or water lines, whatever it is, are put in at the same time. And there's an incredible savings. And if just doing the simple math, it's about 900, it's about, it's about one third of the, of the uh, cost of uh, the, the entire project is from uh, Market Street to uh, Pinewoods. You just talk about linear peak. And the uh, condition and the, uh, uh, the way that portion of Route 9 is right now is absolutely a hazard. You know, left hand turns are impossible. Well, I I, uh, I agree 100%. Why isn't the state doing it? Why, but wait, but no. <laughs> why isn't the state doing any of this? Because that's why we are going through this TAP process, because right. they won't give you any money. I mean, they have done it in certain circumstances. On Route 55, they did it. Uh, um, on um, near Vassar, they did it. Vassar contributed about half. Uh, near Maris, Maris contributed about half to those improvements. <coughs> but hey, uh, if you could, if we can answer that question, mm -hmm. how we get DOT to do it, I, I would, you know, do backflips. But in all, I mean, because we that they are, we had many, many conversations with them early on, appealing to them to uh, their responsibility on on uh, making a historic are a presidential town more vital and attractive and that fell on deaf ears we met with senator saland we met with them all and the mechanism that they now provide is that you can apply for tap funding that's how you get that's the only mechanism that we have had uh, brought to our awareness we've also had lots of discussions with them regarding utilizing the um, storm drain system as a potential connection for sewer. That's absolutely out of the question. Um, and uh, the reference point for where, where the sewer lines are going, they won't be going in the DOT right of way. They're designed to go in the rear of the properties where the majority of the connections are, uh, exist currently for the properties. That was the thought process in the, locating the, um, the collection system towards the rear of the properties. But if, if you had some, some way to uh, get the state to come in here and do our sidewalks and our sewer at the same time, that'd be amazing. We just have gone, we've gone the political route and we've gone the more traditional route of begging uh, and pleading, <laughs> stamping our feet, <laughs> screaming, crying, uh, you know, all those things. But I, I think DOT is a very different place than it was 
a, uh, even a few years ago, unfortunately. So should we wrap this? Yes, yeah, so yeah. I think so. Uh, again, next steps will be continuing to meet with the property owners. We'll be having more public meetings with the property owners. Um, and people can uh, see, keep up with what uh, is going on um, through our town board meetings. We'll be having lots of resolutions going forward that they can make comments on and, and support us and the projects that way. So I want to thank everyone for coming and um, stick around for some really interesting resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to start the uh, second half of our meeting here. All right. Yes, thanks, Kim. Okay, all right. so, all right. Whoops. We took care of the public comment on um, the public hearing. We do have public comment on the resolutions. If anyone would like to uh, make a public comment on any of the resolutions before us, I don't think so. So let's just get these done. Hey, Chief, this is all about you right now. That's all right. Uh, I see. Yes, that's I see right. That. It's our chief here. That's right. This is all about you right now, chief. Yeah, you got to pay attention to this one. Shall Shall I begin? Yes. Resolution 225-1 of 2019. Resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park Town Board to promote Robert J. Benson to permanent Town of Hyde Park Police Chief and grant and grant permanent competitive class status. Second. Roll call on that. Roll call, please. Second uh, by Dave. And Councilman Krupnik. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Marine. Aye. Councilman Schneider. Let me think for a second. <laughs> aye. Supervisor Rohr. Double aye. <laughs> Congratulations, Thanks, Chief. Robert. So proud of you, man. Great. Okay, Dave, it's you're up. It's you. Oh. <laughs> oh, we're finished with that? We don't swear him in, I guess. Oh, this is all about Chief already again. Sworn in. Yeah. This is all about you again, Chief. <laughs> it's all about you again here, the second one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> trying to lay low, are you? Resolution 225 2 of 2019. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Board to approve purchase of two vehicles for the Town of High Park Police Department fleet. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-3 of 2019, resolution adopting local law number B of 2019 okay. to amend section 104-16A1 of the Town of Hyde Park Code to add a stop sign at the terminus of Green Tree Drive South at the point of its intersection with Green Tree Drive North and Hemlock Lane. Second. And do a roll call, please. Councilman Krupnik. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Mar Marine. Aye. Councilman Schneider. Aye. Supervisor Rohr. Aye. Resolution 225-4 of 2019, resolution authorizing the town supervisor to accept the 2018-2019 grant award for the Justice Court Assistance Program, the JSAT. Second. Uh, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-5 of 2019, resolution authorizing the town supervisor to execute an agreement with Video Ventures Limited for the continued taping and televising of town board and planning board meetings. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-6 of 2019, resolution authorizing the town supervisor to execute an agreement with the county of Dutchess to provide coordinated driving while intoxicated checkpoints in designated areas. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-7 of 2019, resolution amending resolution 716-17 of 2018, appointing Connor Tarble to the Town of Hyde Park Conservation Advisory Council, CAC. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-8 of 2019, resolution authorizing the attorney to the town to execute a stipulation of settlement for the DG Strategic II uh, Care of Dollar General versus Board of Assessment Review of the Town of High Park, Dutchess County Index Number 51799 slash 2017 and 52152 slash 2018. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 225-9 of 2019. Resolution reappointing Donna McGrogan to the Town of Hyde Park Board of Ethics. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for that. And last one. Resolution 225-10 of 2019. Resolution commencing the local law adoption process 
for Local Law C, the 2019 Sorry. entitled Amendments to the Town Code, Code an Agreement to the Town's Comprehensive Plan yeah, with amazing. regard to the creation of a Town Core Zoning District. Second. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, second? Yes, mm -hmm. I did. Neil did? Okay, and a roll call, please. No. Let's just, oh, wait. Before I'm we sorry. Vote, I right. just want, for the sorry. record, uh, we, ha we have a packet of information that, that was all sent uh, to the town board members. So, just for the record, I want to make sure that everybody understands that we have the town center vision memorandum. Uh, we have the uh, part one of the full environmental assessment form and the long uh, form uh, EAF narrative to part one. We have the proposed local law. We have the map of the district. And we have the, um, the vision statement and the design and development standards. So these are all the documents that compile the packet of information that we're starting the uh, local law and comprehensive plan amendment process. Um, uh, and the town board is the only involved agency. It's a type one action under seeker. Um, so we are uh, in the resolution. You're also um, designating the town board as the lead agency for the seeker review and commencing that process. All of these documents will be posted on the website and available for inspection um, in the town clerk's office. So, so has Don Bonnie given us that in a digital form? All of these? Yeah, I emailed it. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. To, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and our new website, we can put it on without the digital. Oh, format. okay. I scanned it and emailed everything. Okay, it's very good. It's preferable to not have scans if that's possible. Mm -hmm. If you can get the originals rather than like original digital rather than scans. Uh, um, we'll talk about that. Yeah, no, we got to do a roll. Yeah, yeah, so uh, you know, Neil is just. Uh, he's he's the webmaster right. also, so he's. Okay, so what does he need? Uh, uh, so I'll talk to we'll you talk about it. We talk about it after, yeah. but yeah, just want uh, to. Like I said, it, right? it's a pretty. There's a lot. There's a lot of content here, so we want to make sure that's up on the website mm -hmm. for people to take a look at. Um, yeah, it's pretty dense stuff. So. Highparkny.us. Yes, and uh, that's a good point, Neil, uh, because we are. Do you want to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, Just we, should, we probably need to vote on this first, right? Oh, yeah, good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should. <laughs> did we state the public hearing? That was no, we didn't. Why don't we tell the advice? Okay. So um, we will have a, a public hearing on this document on uh, April 8th. We're going to be setting that as part of this resolution. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing what the public has to, has to think about, has to say about that. Perfect. So April 8th. At 7:05, I assume. Okay, so um, uh, um, a roll. roll call on this as well, please. Councilman Krupnik. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Marine. Aye. Councilman Schneider. Aye. Supervisor Rohr. Aye. Okay, so um, Neil, do you just do we have any more? Sure. That, was that the last one? Yeah, that was. That's it. Okay, so yeah, do you want to just give well, us a well, little? Update? Well, I have everyone's attention. Yeah. Uh, so again, <laughs> thank you. HydeParkNY.us, and many of you probably know, many of you might not know that the uh, website was completely redesigned and launched in October. Uh, it is now very user-friendly. Uh, it probably uh, guaranteed not to give you a headache as opposed to the old website. No offense to the people who were involved in it. It just was very old. Uh, and we try to put as much information on this website as possible so people can be informed about what's going on in our town. Uh, and there's also ways for, for you to stay in touch with us and vice versa. We, we really encourage everybody to sign up for email notifications. Uh, you can sign up for your individual ward uh, notices. You can sign up for community alerts, public notices, et cetera. And when you go to the website, uh, on the left-hand side at the top, it'll, it says sign up for notifications. And all you need to do is type in your email address and choose the ones that you'd like to uh, sign up for, and you'll get an email confirmation, and uh, you'll be able to stay informed. So I think that's great, and uh, I've been, I just went and checked a whole bunch of boxes, and I'm uh, now getting all. You're the getting a bunch of emails. Stuff. Yeah, you so didn't do that before, huh? No, I didn't have. Them all, I didn't have all the boxes. So now you know what's going. Now you know what's going on in town. <laughs> <laughs> Get up to speed. Good point. That's really good. <laughs> on that note, I make a motion to no, close. No wait, I, I do want to. Uh,
Yeah, sometimes I'm surprised, no, but uh, I just did want to mention about uh, the STAR exemptions. That program is coming to a conclusion on the 1st of March, so anyone who thinks they uh, qualify for an extra exemption, uh, please make sure that you go and visit our assessor to, sure that, to be assured that you have provided the necessary paperwork. So um, I did ask um, um, Jennifer um, uh, to give us a update on what those are. So it's New York State Income Verification Program is now mandatory form RP42151 VP and you can get that from our assess assessor and all senior citizen exemption um, holders must file separately for the enhanced STAR and IVP uh, and all enhanced and senior STAR recipients are asked to provide proof of age and eligibility in income uh, this year for auditing purposes. So I know our um, assessor has been extremely busy, but we, we do want to make sure that everyone who is entitled to the exemptions do get them. So the state needs to make that easier instead of yeah. harder for the seniors. That's crazy. Yeah, I think that um, it's it's my understanding anyway that uh, they're making everyone re register this year, but it may not have to occur again yeah, next year. It's just a lot of work for It them. is. It is, but it is actually important that um, no, I get that, that people who have the exemptions do qualify for sure. them. So. And they were cheaters on, on the other way, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Vacation homes and stuff. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's you know, just an, another accountability program. But um, yep. So <laughs> we do hope that they get it in if they qualify. So uh, with that, um, it's been a pleasure on yes. a long meeting. Thanks nice for job. everyone Thank for coming out and uh, further updates. So may I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Tony. Yes, thank you, Tony. <laughs> that was a long one. <laughs> so I'm going to see you tomorrow. Yeah.